Welcome back, Rebel fans. You're here listening to another episode of the Rebel Talk presented by the Rebel Walk. I'm Cam Wicker, and as always, I'm here with Zach Marath. And today we're going to talk a little bit about women's hoops. They just won um, last uh, yesterday in uh, evening against Marquette. They'll be playing Notre Dame tomorrow. We're going to talk a little bit about football, just a little bit. Um, we, ha- we don't have too much because uh, practice, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be continuing to watch practice next week um, as the spring rolls on. And uh, baseball, obviously, a lot to talk about there. Later on in the podcast, they lost the series to Tennessee. And also, we got a little bit of uh, recruiting news for men's basketball as well. Uh, So we're just going to start off, jump into uh, football uh, spring coming up this week. Uh, I wanted to start off and just jump into Jackson Dart uh, a little bit here. Um, I know last week we heard a little bit uh, Kiffin talk about putting this team together and the way that Jackson Dart was involved. And uh, if you want to talk a little bit more, more, a little bit more about that, Zach, and how Jackson Dark kind of went out and got some of these players. Yeah, you know, Kiffin talked about it. It was just incredible to hear about. Uh, one of the main guys he mentioned was Juice Wells, who, you know, he's six one, two ten. He's about the same size as Trey Harris, and he can produce that way as well. So, very special player who Jackson will be throwing to this fall. And then another player that <clears throat> was also mentioned was JJ Pegues. And he talked about kind of this idea of, you know, the last dance and everyone's buying into it. Everyone's coming back. You know, seven uh, offensive starters are returning. Jared Ivey, Pegues, all these different guys are coming together to just try and make this a very special season, hopefully ending in a national championship camp. Absolutely. And um, really just I think Dart's going to take that next step. He's obviously gotten a little bigger. I talked about that in the last episode. And looking at these receivers, I know um, Coach McDonald's kind of been putting out videos on Twitter. And these guys, awesome. they're, they're, he's putting them to work. And it looks like I mean, yeah. Harris looks like he's gotten in better shape. And, I mean, yeah. as, as muscled up and, and, and buff as that guy is and the way that he looks um, and last year, it's, it's hard to, to believe that he got better and bigger this year. But um, I made a tweet um, yesterday, two days ago, about him being – uh, top two and he's not number two so uh, hopefully that'll live up that's to, right to the hype this year and uh, he can be a top receiver in the league along with juice wells and i mean jordan Watkins is back too so that makes it even more exciting uh hopping into the o-line uh some o-line talk i know um on on facebook there was a comment saying that they wanted more talk on the uh transfer o-line uh we'll, we're gonna look to more to do more of that in the future uh zach and i talk uh, talking where you guys can um comment on twitter facebook whatever social media platform ask us a question or even just uh, get us to cover something. And we'll either shout you out if you want to and, um, and put you on the podcast. But um, someone wanted us to talk a little bit about these transfer linemen. And uh, I think we're going to make a prediction of what this line is going to look like next year too, Zach. Um, last year, obviously the line was uh, Jaden Williams, really at left tackle, uh, Victor Saroon, uh, McGee, Warren, James, Michael Pettis, Michael Pettis at right tackle. Uh, that was pretty much across the board all season last year. I think McIntyre maybe got a game at center uh, and then Williams and uh, Saroon kind of just kind of flip flop there at the end of the year with the injuries. Um, but obviously this year, a lot of, a lot of changes going into this, uh, into this, into this off season and into the spring, Diego pounds came in, Nate Kalepo, uh Julius Bulo, and then obviously Jaquan Scott and all those guys are going to look to battle for a starting spot in the spring, Zach. And uh, I just want your thoughts on on at least those three guys, Diego Pounds, Kaleppo, and Bulo, because those are guys are probably going to be starters right off the bat. Yeah, um, they're very large human beings. I'll say that off the bat. <clears throat> Bulo is 6'9", 315, pound, 315 pounds. Kaleppo is 6'6", 330 pounds. You know, those are the guys you want to be able to run through. Those are the gaps you want to find as a running back. Those are the players you want pass protecting you, Cam. I have seen Diego Pounds in person, and I kind of struggle to believe that he is listed at, I think, around 6'6 six, six or 6'7. Six, he just looks that massive of a human being. Yeah. And we talked about it before we got on. He's an elite pass protector. He does a fantastic job. And these three additions alone, are, it just it takes that offensive line to the next level. <clears throat> I crunched some numbers, and it looks like almost every single player on this year's offensive line has a couple more inches of height and the offensive line will also have roughly 40 more pounds added to it as well. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I mean, seeing Diego pounds in, in person for the first time this past week, uh, that was, that was a bit of a shot. Uh, right. Like you said, he doesn't really look six, six. It looks like he's about, um, I think Bulo's listed or at six, eight. Yeah. Bulo's listed at six, eight. Yeah. He looks like more of Bulo's height. Um, when, you, right. when you look at him, 
Uh, Bulo obviously is um, not as uh, as big bodied as the rest of these other guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's he's listed about three fifteen. I don't know if he's gained weight since since he's got two old Miss, but obviously he's a big body. He plays right. guard. Um, usually don't see tall guys play guard a lot either, and that's going to be right. interesting. Two six six uh, plus guys playing in the middle of the field. I believe Caleb Warren's like six four six five as well. So that's three yep. big bodies just right over the top of Dart who's obviously a bigger guy too. So we'll have to see how that works. Uh, this year, uh, like I said, I was going to make a little prediction of what the line was going to look like. This year, yeah, I believe yeah, Diego is probably going to be one of the best pass blockers in the country this year. He was one of the best pass blockers uh, as a as a sophomore last year for Drake May in North Carolina. Um, I believe he'll start left tackle this year, most likely with Jaden Williams coming behind him and uh, maybe giving yeah. him some breathers, obviously on the right side too, for Micah Pettis. Going to that right side, Micah Pettis will probably start in the fall coming off that injury. Uh, we'll see how that works. Uh, I don't, I'm pretty sure we probably won't see much of him in the spring. But um, if he doesn't, if he's not able to go for a couple of games there, expect to see Jaden Williams there. I know um, Bulo, pretty big body, 6'8". He probably can move to right tackle, move him there. Or Jeremy James, who's obviously played right tackle in the past as well. And then um, uh, the guards, Kalepo and Bulo, but from Washington, I think both of them are going to be guards this year for Ole Miss. Uh, probably Kalepo at left guard, Bulow at right guard. They both flip flopped a lot last year at um, at Washington. I believe Bulow finished the year at right guard for Washington. Kalepo finished the year at left guard for Washington. That was on their championship run. So you probably see a bit of the same of that here. And then obviously Jaquan Scott um, uh, from Southern Miss played a lot of guard there. I think he had 30 games starting guard there. Yeah. Uh, me and Zach talked about before the podcast. Maybe, maybe you move him to center. We'll see how uh, that works with Caleb Warren. Obviously, there's a pretty probably good relationship there with him and Jackson Dart. Uh, so you probably want to keep that going if Caleb Warren uh, continues to perform. But yeah. Jaquan Scott, you can explore that center role that obviously uh, gives you more depth there. And then obviously Jeremy James and Jaden Williams mm-hmm. probably be rotational guys. Last year were starters, and it's tough. You got two. You got two premier talents coming in at the guard position from a, from a national championship team. And then you got Diego Pounds who could possibly work himself into a first round conversations at some point this year, if he's a really good left tackle for Jackson Dart. Exactly, Cam. And, you know, we hit on all the starters, but I do want to take into account just the depth that this year's line brings. Um, looking back at last year, the backups who I really recognized were Jaden Williams, um, Reese McIntyre and Eli Acker. And then moving into this year, I made another list, and I have Jaden Williams, Caleb Warner, Jaquan Scott, whoever's starting, which will probably be Caleb Warren. So we'll say Jaquan Scott, Jeremy James, Bryson Sanders, Preston Cushman, who you could have said for last year, but I've seen it in play a lot. Ethan Fields, Eli Acker, and Reese McIntyre. The list goes from three reliable backup linemen to about eight. So you're almost doubling that, which is a good problem to have because, again, we saw in that Georgia game when these linemen – start going down things get very difficult especially when you're on the road in a place like Athens absolutely and obviously um these guys are getting to practice against one of the best defensive lines in the country for sure one of the best defensive lines in the SEC obviously you get to practice against guys like Walter Nolan every day that makes you a lot better uh moving forward uh obviously we're gonna stop right there we'll jump into a little bit of women's hoops uh marquette versus old miss on uh saturday old miss took the win 67 to 55 pretty close game for most part especially through the first half leading up into the third quarter and so old miss began to pull away but uh, i believe marquette had the lead at the end of the first quarter it seemed like yeah. uh miss kind of struggling a little bit from the field missing some uh, open shots missing some uh shot opportunities in the first quarter, and then they had an explosion in the second quarter. 22 points in the second quarter. Madison Scott began to get buckets to fall. Kennedy Ty Williams began to hit three-pointers. And uh, really, they were just playing aggressive defense uh, from the start. Uh, I wanted to commend uh, Ayanna Thompson. Uh, She played exceptional defense off the bench. She's 20-plus minutes off the bench. Usually, she's a shooter, too. I mean, last year, you saw her down the stretch uh, for that that Sweet 16 team. Uh, She was a shooter in the stretch for that team. But um, really, she came into that game and just played a lot of defense and really didn't see her come off the bench a lot this year. But um, she played 20 minutes in that game. Uh, Obviously, didn't have Snooker Collins in that tournament game. So that was a big role for Thompson there. And Madison Scott looks probably um, at at the best shot-making ability she's going to get. And she's obviously probably going to get better. She's coming back for Team 50. So that that is great. uh, great. Take some pressure off Ole Miss fans, if uh, if you will. 
And then Kennedy oh. Todd Williams, she looks really good. Uh, obviously, I think um, uh, she she went to the Elite Eight or the Sweet 16 with UNC a year ago. So she's got that experience. And I think this team can can make that next step going into Notre Dame. Yeah, I know you, you took the words out of my mouth, Cam. Kennedy Todd Williams, two for four from three. You're going to need some of those shots to fall, especially against a team like Notre Dame. And then just moving into that matchup, you know, you have to play Ole Miss defense. This, this Notre Dame team, they shoot very similar to Marquette in terms of field goal percentage and three-point percentages. Ole Miss held Marquette to about 10%, 10 points lower in terms of percentages than they usually do, so they're going to have to do a very similar thing. But, again, it's a different scenario. You're in South Bend. It's going to be packed out with Notre Dame fans. They're the two seed. It, it's going to be competitive. You have to play Ole Miss defense. The good news is there's a lot of experience and a lot of confidence. You know, Coach Yo said it in her press conference today. A lot of the pressure is on Notre Dame because as much as they have that home court situation, you're supposed to win. You're the two seed, you're at home, and you have all these expectations coming at you. So hopefully that can come back to bite them tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, obviously uh, going into that Notre Dame game, Notre Dame is a 10-point favorite. They're the two seed. Um, they're a really tough squad. They got a couple, they, I believe they're one of those teams that have a couple of those freshmen that are changing the game yeah. of uh, women's hoops this year. I believe they have a freshman that's averaging about 20 a game. Uh, yeah. I'm not, I can't remember her name off the top of my head. I think her name's Hannah uh, Higdall. Hannah but, um, Hidalgo. Yeah. Yeah. Hannah Hidalgo. Yeah. Uh, she averages about like 23 a game. So um, she's, she's definitely uh, someone that, that, that Ole Miss defense is going to have to have to look out for from this opening tip on that game tomorrow. That's at 1 p.m. Uh, on ESPN tomorrow. Uh, that's for a trip to the Sweet 16 where Ole Miss got a year ago. Uh, going back to that Marquette game, really um, so someone who came out as a surprise for me in that uh, Marquette game, really doing a little scouting report before the game, uh, and then she came out of nowhere, uh, was Ro Rosen Kumu. She had, she had 18 points, uh, really averaged like seven, seven points, I think, for most of the year. Uh, obviously, she's a, a bit yeah. of a passer. I think she averaged like five assists this year. And I think she had like five or six uh, yesterday as well, but she had 18, really. Ole Miss was shutting down those uh, two guards from Marquette right from the start. Uh, Ware was really having a tough time. I think King ended up with like maybe like 10. Really shutting yeah. down those guards, forcing loss, uh, Larson to pass it to someone else. And Akuma was that person for uh, Marquette. She had 18, was tough to guard in the first half, specifically for Ole Miss. But obviously um, – in the fourth quarter, Ole Miss held um, Marquette to nine points, and that was really just the difference there. Um, uh, uh, Rita Ibakwe and uh, Tia Singleton really just kind of uh, out-toughed uh, Larson in the paint there at the end of the game. It looked like Ole Miss had more of a size advantage. And um, I haven't looked too much into Notre Dame's um, roster to see what their size looks like. But um, that's what something that Ole Miss needs to use to their advantage moving forward. They're a bigger team. They have um, two or three bigger uh, forwards that that play more rotational minutes and Ibakwe, Richardson, and Singleton. And I believe if you keep all three of those fresh, uh, you have a chance because, I mean, that's two six six two plus forwards that can get you rebounds, play defense against these tough teams moving forward. Absolutely, Cam. And, you know, just to wrap up women's basketball, we talked about it a little bit earlier, but, you know, just shout out to Carissa Richardson, Zakai Stevenson, and Anaya Thompson for really just establishing and producing off the bench, I believe together they scored 12 points. And when you want to make a deep run in March, you need those bench players con to contribute and they're doing just that. So look for that tomorrow afternoon as well. Uh, yeah. And shout out to uh, Karis from the road walk. I believe um, she was at <laughs> uh, South Bend at the game covering it. And uh, she took a bunch of pictures of Coach O. She took the picture of Coach O uh, and her husband making the same pose in the background. And I believe it was it ESPN or was a sports center uh, that, that reposted it. Both of them. Both yeah. of them. So, or, yeah, um, I think, OK, Sports Center posted it, but both of them reached out, which is pretty cool. OK, yeah, that's that's, that's a pretty cool <laughs> achievement, especially on your first trip out to uh, cover some uh, some Ole Miss sports. So um, shout out to Karis for that at the Rebel Walk and uh, looking forward to uh, seeing more work from her in the future. Absolutely. Uh, before we move in to a little bit uh, of a uh, portal talk for men's basketball, we'll take a moment to talk about the sponsors on the screen. Uh, Dead Soxy, obviously, you can find Dead Soxy on the Ole Miss website as well. 25% off code, Rebel Walk. That's Rebel Walk, 25% off code. And then, obviously, uh, Rebel Closet, Get Ready for, uh, Rebel for Less. You can find that on the Rebel on the Rebel Walk website as well is where you can find all of the Ole Miss uh, Rebel Walk sponsors on the rebelwalk.com. 
uh, moving into men's basketball, recruiting talk, uh, really kind of, I wouldn't say quiet, but um, I would say um, not much movement. A lot of, a lot of talks, a lot of Ole Miss name, a lot of people getting thrown into the Ole Miss conversation. Uh, but not much movement so far. We, are, we know Rashad Marshall uh, entered the transfer portal out of Ole Miss, losing Jamarian Sharp, losing Al Flanagan, most likely losing uh, Matthew Morrell. So you're going to have to replace yeah. a little if you're if you're um, if you're Chris Beard, and then you don't know what what the rest of these guys are going to do either. <coughs> um, obviously, uh, these are these are other guys like Juju Murray, Brandon Murray, and Cisse. Uh, I don't know if uh, Cisse and, and Brandon Murray can transfer again uh, because of NCAA rules, but uh, obviously keep out a look for other transfers as well. Uh, but really, uh, TJ at, at the Rebel Walk has been uh, talking to us about some of these names coming into the portal, and uh, Zach uh, has a little breakdown of, of some of these names that we've been hearing moving forward. Yeah, the first one I want to talk about, I actually, this is my fault, Cam, but I didn't include him in our conversation before, but it's Michael Ajayi. That's a tough last name there. If anyone knows how to pronounce it, please correct me. He'll be visiting Ole Miss. Uh, he's out of Pepperdine. He's six foot seven. Um, again, number six player in the transfer portal, which is awesome. And that's obviously a guy who you want. Chris Beard, you know, he likes physical players. Six seven is an incredible size to do that. And I'm looking forward to see where that seeing where that goes. And then getting into the players that we discussed, Cam, to start off, let's get into Cameron Hunter. Uh, he's out of our central Arkansas. He did not play last year because he broke his foot, but he's 6'3, he's 200 pounds, he's a guard. He was all he was an all Atlantic Sun Conference player in 2022 and 2023. Chris Beard also took an in-home visit with him. And in his sophomore season, before he got injured, he averaged, he averaged 17 points per game. So a guy who can score, who can set the table for you, and a guy that Chris Beard clearly wants if he's willing to give him an in-home visit. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I watched a little bit of a film on, on Hunter uh, before this, and um, he's, he's really a scorer, 17 points per game uh, two years ago as a sophomore year. Obviously sat out uh, for injury this past season, but um, he's a scorer. He's a, uh, he reminded me a little bit of Sears from Alabama watching his film. He's a, he's a bigger, uh, not a, not a bigger guard, but I guess a, a bigger bodied guard uh, than Ole Miss has had in the past. And uh, I believe he's a, has a left-handed shot as well. So obviously if you pair him there with Juju Murray, there's two left-handed guards in the backcourt, uh, but really just a pure score. Uh, he, he, if he's, um, I'm not sure uh, how it would work out if you go get him and you don't get another traditional point guard, obviously he had about three right. assists a game, I think two years ago. So that's probably something he needs to work on as well as Juju Murray is uh, being, becoming a more traditional point guard if Ole Miss doesn't go get a, a, a more traditional one. But uh, really excited about Cameron Hunter uh, uh, being in this in this portal talk. And uh, obviously a lot of these guys are gonna be linked to Chris Beard uh, from, right. from past destinations. And one of those, Past destinations I would like to talk about. Another player is Layden Glocker. Uh, he was a, actually a true freshman at Arkansas. He was a top 50 recruit in the 2023 class. Again, very talented. He didn't play a whole bunch this season, only have, averaged about four, four points per game. But you can tell a lot based off the fan base's reaction when someone hits the portal. Arkansas fans were not happy, Cam. So that gives me hope. That gives me faith that he's a good player with a lot of potential. And again, there hasn't really been much development, but he was being heavily recruited by Auburn coming out of high school. Who's on Ole Miss's staff? Who was on Auburn staff at the time? Wes Flanagan. Who's from Arkansas? Wes Flanagan. So there is a connection there. This kid is 6'2". He's in 180 pounds. And like you talked about, Ole Miss doesn't have that traditional true point guard. Layden Blocker is that guy. So we'll see if anything happens there. Um, yeah, Layden Blocker, on. watching him. Uh, watching Layden Blocker. Uh, he's like you said, really could be a true point guard for Ole Miss if they go get him. Obviously, Wes Flanagan has that that ties to him, and really Chris Beard kind of gets his product a lot of the time from Arkansas, so that would be interesting there. Yeah. And really watching Layden Blocker, uh, more more film on him. Um, he's more of a swift guard too. He kind of um, just moves swiftly to the rim, kind of not too quickly, but more of a. Um, I know this is a, a crazy comparison, but but more the way Luka Dantich kind of gets to the rim, kind of more smooth, uh, more fluently, not uh, forcing or, or aggressively. That's kind of what I, I see from Layden Blocker, kind of more smooth uh, transition to the hoop when he uh, when he drives in the lane, and then obviously the passing ability that he has. No, I, I love the comparison, Cam. I think if you're going to do comparison, it's got to be someone people know. 
So I, I respect it. Um, I want you to get into Terrace Reed from Michigan because this kid's an absolute force. Yeah, Terrace Reed from Michigan. I remember uh, just before the pod, I was showing you a little, a little, little YouTube clip on him. Uh, 6'10", 260, big guy. <laughs> Obviously, Michigan made a coaching change. Uh, they just went and got Dusty May. That's a uh, big, big time for Michigan. Uh, but obviously, nine points per game, seven rebounds, uh, one and a half blocks last year for Reed. Uh, if, if Ole Miss can go get this guy and you pair him with Cissé in the front court and then obviously getting John Ball, that'd be three rotational big guys you can have. And, uh, that, I mean, last year you had two rotational big guys. Uh, and if you have three this year and then the guy like Reed, who who can just be aggressive and just a force in the paint. And we've seen what happened to Ole Miss uh, when they play guys like that in the past. Uh, from Kentucky, guys from uh, from South Carolina, guys right. uh, guys from Alabama, bigger bodied forwards uh, that just they couldn't couldn't handle. If you get a guy like Reed, you can guard those guys in the future. And then obviously the potential that CC showed uh, at, at at Oklahoma State the year before coming to Ole Miss, eight yeah. rebounds a game, two blocks. If he can just kind of recreate that some in the next year for Ole Miss, that would be a, a huge step in in the front court it, for Ole Miss. Yeah, it really would be, and it's going to be something you need if. You want to let alone get into March Madness, win in March Madness. And then the final player I want to talk about, probably one of my favorite players to talk about in the portal, Sincere Parker out of St. Louis University. Um, this kid is a guy who can score at will. He's a 6'3 guard, and he had, a, I believe, a 42% three-point percentage. So just to put that in perspective, Matt Morrell had a 39 three-point percentage. Um, he missed a lot of the season, about one, one and a half months, because he broke a bone in his foot. But regardless, he still averaged 16 points per game. He's hearing from Georgia, Mizzou, Cal, one of those guys who everyone's reaching out to. Again, teams in March that you watch on TV right now have a player who they can go to, who they give the ball to when it's late in a game, who they need a bucket from. And although Matt Morrell did that a lot for Ole Miss, I don't know if he was the guy who could consistently put out that product when you needed it. you know. And that's why you have to go get a player who can make shots like this. Yeah, obviously, Sincere Parker, like you said, big time shot maker, forty two percent from the from three point, and you saw Matt Morell, thirty nine percent from him last year, and that was one of his best years shooting, probably right. his best year shooting. And um, if if you can get a guy like Sincere Parker, like you said, big time shot maker, you have you don't have to rely on someone, you don't have to wonder who you're going to rely on for that final shot. Yeah, just give him the ball, everyone let him do his thing, maybe get open if he gets double teamed. Uh, obviously, Wes, I mean, Al Flanagan was kind of that guy, too, who could go get you a shot when needed, but obviously he's gone sure. as well. So if you can get a guy like Sincere Parker who who can just shoot it at will and make those big-time shots, obviously everyone's going to get him. Uh, Chris Beard's going to have to make a, a big offer at him if he wants to bring him here in Oxford. 100%, Cam. Uh, you got anyone else you want to talk about? Uh, not not on uh, men's basketball, so we'll, we'll move into uh, baseball, obviously. Awesome. um this baseball, uh, baseball this past weekend, bit of a disappointing outing uh, in on on Friday and Sunday for the Diamond Rebs. Uh, bright thing was Liam Doyle looked outstanding on Saturday. Yeah. Uh, six innings, uh, went out there for the seventh, got a couple hits off of him, had to take him out. But um, through six, he had ten strikeouts. Uh, second time, like second time this year, he had ten plus strikeouts. So um, really, just um, a force on the mound these past, especially these past two weeks in SEC play. Uh, and he didn't get the win. Obviously, um, I think Ole Miss. Uh, I mean, Ole Miss didn't. Um, I mean, gave up the lead uh, after Duel left the game. So obviously, uh, the win did not get credit to Duel, but no yeah. discredit to uh, his performance. And obviously, um, uh, going into Friday, going back to Friday's game, uh, it was more of just a disappointing showing uh, all around from the bats and and the pitching staff. Um, Gunnar Dennis just couldn't couldn't keep the ball out of the air. I think it was uh, five home runs in that opening uh, night right. against Tennessee. So it was a bit of a rough one uh, for for everyone uh, in the Ole Miss fan base, in, in the Ole Miss uh, in Ole Miss Nation fan base, players, coaches uh, on Friday. Uh, but I mean, really, just looking at that Friday game, uh, I mean, there's really nothing nothing good that came from that. Uh, obviously, you want to just flush that and, and move move into the next weekend. But like I said uh, in, in the pod like a couple of days ago, coming home with one win this past weekend is not the worst thing possible. You're three and three in the SEC, and it's, it's not the end of the world. You're, it's, it's early in the season. You're playing Kentucky next week. Obviously, Kentucky's a tough ball club, but um, you got them at home, and, and you're still sitting three and three in the SEC. 
Exactly, Cam. And, you know, SEC, when the teams are at home in the SEC, it's very difficult. What did we snap Tennessee's 18 game winning streak at home? Yeah. That's like, that's just ridiculous. But again, Friday and Sunday, not a lot of fun to watch. I want to talk about Saturday. We talked about Doyle, incredible, incredible stuff. I believe he has 37 strikeouts on the year, which puts him top 50 nationwide. Liam Doyle didn't start a game until March 9th, folks. And he is top wow. 50 nationwide in strikeouts. Like, they, just incredible stuff, electric stuff, as Coach Bianco said. Andrew Fisher, oh, my gosh. Did, I, I think I watched both both home run clips no less than 20 times, Cam. Just the way <laughs> the ball came off the bat was unbelievable, dude. Yeah, um, watching, watching those two home runs from uh, Fisher on Saturday, just unbelievable shots. Both of them were um, over the scoreboard, halfway up the scoreboard. Doesn't matter. They were, I mean, 400, 440 plus feet, 430 plus feet, whatever they were. Crazy. Just monster shots off the bat. Uh, Fisher's special. Uh, Fisher's going to be a special for years to come. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure if he's a draft eligible, draft eligible sophomore. Uh, I know a lot that, a lot that happens a lot in is. baseball, but I don't think he will be. I don't think he will turn 21 before uh, the deadline. So um, I believe he'll have to come back another year. He comes back to Ole Miss, and uh, he has a chance to uh, add on to that greatness here. And uh, I think he has a chance to be uh, for sure a twenty plus point, I mean twenty plus home run uh, hitter this season. Um, he's already hundred percent now. So um, I mean, just uh, it was I think it was his third game, uh, third multi home run game this year already. So that's just insane. We're only two SEC series in. Um, uh, another another hitter in that Ole Miss lineup that I wanted to talk about was uh, Jackson Ross. Kind of struggled a little bit this past weekend. Struggled a little bit in that uh, South Carolina series too. Uh, but uh, I think I believe he had a decent day today. Hit a home run today as well in in the loss today, obviously. Uh, but um, uh, Jackson Ross has kind of been struggling, and really that the top of the lineup as a whole outside of Fisher has kind of not struggled, but uh, I guess um, in, uh, when when the team is struggling, also the top of the lineup is struggling. But obviously, uh, there's there's a lot to take into account. You're you're playing with the you're playing you're playing down by multiple runs. Uh, your, uh, the pitching staff's giving up runs, so it's, it's, it makes it a little bit harder to come by some runs and, uh, and get some base hits to fall uh, for that Ole Miss team. But really, just um, mo- moving moving into next week, moving into into Kentucky, you just gotta hope you can get some production at the bottom of the lineup. Really, that's just been the the most problem for Ole Miss this year, uh, in 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 the bats wise, just. Really, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Not much production there. Obviously, Trayson Hughes is starting to come on a little bit. Luke Hill is starting to come on a little bit. Uh, Will Furness is starting to come on a little bit. But you want to see more guys uh, like Reagan Burford, like Bo Gatlin, uh, like Smithwick, like Birch. Uh, really, just get some base hits a little bit more. Get on base a lot more in these SEC ball games. Absolutely. And a guy I do want to give credit to is Braden Randall. He, I think it was back-to-back games with Homer's Cam. Yeah, just yeah. really cool to see. You know, he's. He's a stud all around. He's from Texas, true freshman, really fun player to watch, and I'm excited to see him back at second base here in Oxford. And then, like you said, I, I did think the top of the order struggled a little bit, but I was it was nice to see in that Saturday game Jackson Ross kind of start that rally after struggling and then watching Ethan Groff hit that RBI to put Ole Miss ahead and kind of seal the deal there. The last player I want to mention here is Connor Spencer. I truly think every time he takes the mound, it's just electric. He's very passionate, showing emotions, throwing 95 plus. Like that's the guy who I want closing ball games, Cam. Absolutely, and we'll we'll have to see what the rotation will look like moving forward for Ole Miss. Yeah. Uh, obviously, uh, we don't know what's what's in the mind of Mike Bianco, but uh, uh, I guess uh, we we talked about it a little bit uh, what what we I guess uh, what probably be the most hypothetical thing to do here is move Liam Doyle to Friday, probably Riley Maddox to Saturday, and then see what you do on Sunday, either Sonia or, or Dennis there or, or someone else like Mendez, maybe, maybe Braden Jones. And you uh, do, uh, uh, you kind of just go with reliever arms on Sunday, like Tennessee did today. Uh, but we'll have to see what that looks like moving forward. Obviously they'll play Austin P on Tuesday. We'll see who starts then and then Kentucky this weekend. That's all we got for baseball, guys. Anything you got, Zach? I just want to, you know, elaborate on what you said. I think it has to be Doyle Maddox and then Mendes or Dennis on Sunday. And also just point out, 
this rotation is missing JT Quinn, and Xavier, Reeves, Xavier Reeves, and Hunter Elliott. I'm not trying to make Ole Miss fans upset, but that's just a tough reality right now. So you kind of have to work with that and just move on. Yeah, Revis, losing Revis and Elliott this year, not having those guys in that uh, in that weekend rotation, big loss for the Rebels. That, that could be three lefties right there with Doyle, uh, right. Elliott, and Revis in that weekend rotation, and that would be just absolutely filthy. Um, that's all we got for you guys today. Make sure to tune into uh, the rebelwalk.com for all your Ole Miss sports needs. Thank <laughs> you.